If you've ever wandered through downtown Portland, or at least seen a map of the area, you've noticed there's two distinct multi-block long stretches of green space that almost line up perfectly with each other. The ones to the south are the South Park blocks, and the ones to the north, the North Park blocks. The origin of the South Park blocks dates back to 1852, and the North blocks date back to 1869, at which time the hopes of the city were to connect the two as a continuous park. So why, more than 150 years later, has this never happened? Well first, let's get to know these places a little bit. Portland was only a couple of years old when one of its earliest prominent citizens, Daniel H. Lounsdale, was credited with providing several blocks of land that were ultimately narrowed down to a stretch within Park Avenue running from Jackson Street to Salmon Street. While designated as Park Space, for years, this muddy area was almost isolated from town and primarily used by people riding their horses and carriages. By 1877, a concerted effort took place to revive the site, transforming it into one of the most charming spots in town. After a while, the land around it became coveted, eventually leading to being lined by Italianate-style mansions. And with recent decades, the blocks have been filled with various structures, including statues and fountains. With Portland State establishing itself in downtown during the 1950s, their campus surrounds the southern half of the park blocks, and the old homes have been replaced by such things as the Portland Art Museum, the Oregon Historical Society, and several churches. But while this stretch was still just a muddy horse trail, to the north, in the historically rougher part of town, Captain John H. Cooch obtained a large plot of land, of which he immediately dedicated several blocks to be park space. By 1869, the North Park Blocks were established, running between 8th and Park Avenues, and running north and south between Ankeny and Gleason Streets. Unlike its charming counterpart to the south, the North Blocks did not blossom in the same way. For a long time, they were bordered by various nondescript buildings and simple dwellings. The area's reputation as the slightly rougher of the two Park Block stretches is at least partially due to its close proximity to Old Town Chinatown, which also used to be Portland's notorious North End. Still, these blocks have come into their own and have plenty of charm, and the southernmost block there, Ankeny Plaza, has recently become a prime food cart spot in the city. Each set of blocks has their own charm and make for a nice walkthrough. Francis Pettigrove, the man credited with providing Portland its name, first arrived in the Pacific Northwest in 1842. Shortly after his arrival, he would take on half the interest in more than 600 acres that had been obtained in 1843 by William Overton and Asa Lovejoy after they noticed the land's appeal while drifting down the Willamette River to Oregon City. Much of these acres make up downtown Portland today. Overton did not stay in the area long, and he sold off his half-interest in the land to Pettigrove for the sum of $50 in goods and supplies to help him relocate. Both he and Lovejoy got to work, establishing the town site of Portland there in 1845, after Pettigrove won a coin flip against Lovejoy to name the city. 
Understandably, the two then began selling off plots at the new town site. Lovejoy ultimately sold off his interest to Benjamin Stark, another key character in this story. And as the story then goes, looking to make one last score, Pettigrove sold off the whole thing while Stark was out of town. He sold it to Daniel H. Lounsdale, who arrived in Portland in 1848 for $5,000. By 1850, Lounsdale reported plans to have a small stretch of land used specifically for park space. A survey was done, and an outline map was produced, laying out the town streets. One block was to be thinner than all of the rest, and this is where the park blocks would be, conveniently lined on both sides by a Park Street, now Park Avenue. Lounsdale was heavily inspired to create park space based on previous visits to various cities in Europe where he saw that the locals thoroughly enjoyed their open public spaces. 1852 is regarded by many as the year these park blocks were officially established. This stretch of blocks originally ran south to north from Jackson Street all the way up to Stark Street, named specifically after Benjamin Stark. For nearly a decade, this is how the park blocks were organized, but it's not how they would remain. First off, in addition to operating behind Stark's back, Francis Pettigrove did not appear to have been totally honest in his sale to Lounsdale. Old newspaper articles from the 1870s note that Pettigrove had taken out quitclaim deeds on much of his land prior to selling it to Lounsdale. In taking on quit claims, he was relinquishing his interests in those properties, at which time it appears multiple other people staked claims on some of those properties. So Pettigrove sold off a lot of land that he did not even have an interest in anymore. Despite all of this, at the time, the attitude was that Lounsdale had paid Pettigrove for the land, and he was officially regarded as the owner as of 1850. In March of 1852, he also officially filed with the state's land office. Everything seemed on the up and up, and even as the park blocks just loomed as muddy space on the edge of town, it was still considered a park until 1862. This is the year that Daniel Lounsdale and his wife would pass away. This is where the information gets a little conflicted, depending on which resource you use. Some say Daniel did not have a will made out when he died, while others say his wife Nancy did not have a will made out. However, because the land fell into Nancy's possession after he died, I get the feeling Daniel did actually have a will, but Nancy likely did not. Once she passed away, the land fell a bit into limbo, and it was noted that the land did not simply pass on to her next of kin because she had not signed pertinent paperwork on the matter. To make things even worse, the fact that Daniel Lounsdale had the land in his possession when the Donation Land Claim Act was passed in 1850 pushed things even more into his favor. Alas, this act was passed with a strong colonization motive and solidified the idea of taking the land in Portland from its native settlers. So the idea that Two random fellows on a boat ride down to Oregon City just stumbled onto some land that would ultimately become a metropolis is only one side of the story. The act also served to negate land claims recorded previous to its enactment. This could explain why, even with people making claims on Lounsdale's land long before he got it from Pettigrove, it seems everyone just turned a deaf ear. The fact that Nancy Lounsdale did not have the proper paperwork done sparked a more than 10-year-long battle by the Lounsdale heirs to regain this property, a battle that never proved to be successful. 
What adds further confusion to the matter is trying to understand exactly who had control of this land right after Nancy's death. It's stated that it fell into control of the city, and yet there are reports that the Lounsdale's heirs tried to sell it to the city, but they could not agree on a price. Furthermore, it was stated that the city never really had sufficient control of the land, never having the valid deed to it. This implies that, for at least a short period of time, the heirs maybe did have some power over the land, but ultimately much of this property would fall into the hands of other private owners, perhaps some who made claims on the land before the sale to Lounsdale. While the heirs continued their fight through the 1860s, little more happened on the matter. That was until Captain John Cooch came along and established his North Park blocks in 1869. With the falling out that followed the death of the Lounsdales, not all of the park block's land was lost. In taking control of all these acres, Daniel brought on two partners, William Williams Chapman and Stephen Coffin. After a hearty political career elsewhere, Chapman settled in Portland where he helped found the Oregonian newspaper. In the city's plaza blocks, Two adjoining blocks between 3rd and 4th Avenues and Salmon and Madison Streets are named after Lounsdale and Chapman. Coffin had been a prominent businessman, former militia officer, and helped found Oregon's Republican Party. This is important as Chapman maintained control of the South Park Block's land running from Salmon Street to Mill Street, and Coffin controlled this land from Mill all the way down to Jackson Street. They both sold off these blocks to the city in the 1870s. It's worth mentioning here that historic documentation mentioned that the park blocks had stretched further south to Clifton Street. While I couldn't find any documentation otherwise to corroborate this, both illustrations and pictures of the blocks do seem to vindicate this. Whoever owned this land south of Jackson Street may have willingly added this area to the blocks, or perhaps they just didn't develop it and thus it was only grass and trees. Pictures just before Interstate 405 passed through here show that even by 1964, this space south of Jackson Street was still park space. But in regards to the Lounsdale fallout, the only blocks lost were those running from Salmon Street to Stark Street. This was a six-block stretch, and only two blocks north, even though it's really like a block and a half, was Ankeny Plaza, the start of the North Park blocks, by 1869. It should be no surprise then that, starting in 1869, the city of Portland began a strong push to purchase these eight blocks standing between the two parks. They contacted the owners of the blocks running from Salmon to Stark, offering them $3,000 per block. Knowing how badly the city wanted this land, the owners played hardball, asking for $6,000 a block. This same year, the city also already had invested money in expanding City Park, or rather Washington Park today. Because of this, they had limited funds while going after these former park blocks and a deal could never be struck. Despite being short on funds in 1869, by 1870 it appears the city was in a much better way, financially. That year, the city council passed a proposal to pay out $92,000 to the owners of the six blocks between Salmon and Stark more than two and a half times what the owners were asking for in the previous year. In the end, this is likely what killed the deal was it was probably just too much for the city to offer and the deal never went through. To make matters worse, the two blocks between Stark and where the North Block started that also needed to be obtained were still under the ownership of Benjamin Stark. After initially offering to donate the land to the city, Starks 
capitalist side kicked in, and instead he demanded an absurd $138,000 for the two blocks. This was unfortunate as, even if the city could get their hands on these six other blocks, Benjamin Stark stood stoutly between these parks, keeping them from being completed. And by the mid-1870s, the more than decade-long efforts by the Lounsdale heirs to regain land finally dried up. No completed park blocks in the city's immediate future. By the time of a 1901 Portland Parks report, they lamented this lost opportunity, calling this unfortunate failure something to be greatly deplored. By the time of this 1901 report, there was still that desire to make these continuous park blocks a reality, noting by this time that it would likely cost the city around a quarter of a million dollars to obtain the necessary blocks. But the report expressed that it still may have been worth it, all the way down to possibly condemning some of the properties on these blocks, which is a little bit unscrupulous. But at the same time, this idea never came to fruition. Only two years later, in 1903, Portland brought on prominent landscape architect John Charles Olmsted to create a parks plan for the city. Even in his efforts, he noted that trying to obtain these lost blocks would probably be too expensive for the city. This perspective was solidified as the city ended up spending a lot of its money intended for parks in dealing with various legal land issues, leaving them only a small amount to actually invest on the city's parks. Come 1907, a tax bond to the amount of $2 million was put up for the people to vote on, with the thought that some of the money would be put towards reacquiring those lost blocks. Unfortunately, the bond failed, and another missed opportunity. Come 1912, the city brought on prominent American architect Edward Herbert Bennett, who'd obtained great recognition for his work on the 1909 Plan of Chicago. His Greater Portland Plan was ambitious, while admittedly not being very practical but also amazing had it actually happened. At the heart of the plan, the city would become more like Paris, France, and it had major emphasis on expanding the amount of acreage dedicated to park space within the city. Bennett was then, obviously, a major proponent for the completion of these park blocks. In classic Parisian style, Bennett wanted there to be a collection of massive traffic circles where routes from various directions would connect. One of his planned sites for a traffic circle was at Park and Burnside, right at the base of the North Park Blocks. This circle would have also obliterated much of Ankeny Plaza. With the Park Blocks needing to pass directly through here, it's a wonder how these continuous blocks would have been done needing to circumvent this massive circle. We'll never know, as even after Bennett's plan was approved by the city, it was never actually implemented. Uh, so confusing, I need to get over there, but I can't get through this way because there's off ramps and stuff. To go up and wrap around like these houses, just to talk to you about some parks. Ah. This is actually Park Avenue, though. This is a little extension. Because this is Lincoln and Park. Right here. So actually, technically, I am on Park Avenue right now, which is the road that splits in two, and the park blocks go right down the middle. And here's where Park turns to Clifton. Clifton climbs up that way. And actually, based on imagery, some imagery shows that the park went a little past Clifton. This little patch of grass here was probably technically the end point of the park blocks once upon a time. Because we're lined up pretty perfectly with them. So this is probably 
the southernmost tip of the park blocks once upon a time. Because if you turn, come safe. And here's where Interstate 405 crosses. It was constructed in parts in the 1960s. So this used to, I mean, I guess, you know, it's a wide thing. It's a wide overpass and they put grass on it. So it's a little park blocky, I guess. But it's still not, you know, considered the park blocks anymore because the center of it would be right here where the street's going through. But we see dead ahead. This is the current southernmost entry point of the south park blocks. Primarily coming in at Portland State University, which has grown and grown and grown over the years. So it's gone from a couple of buildings to kind of encompassing this whole area. Yeah, still today, through my, my whole walk through the difference between the South Park blocks and the North Park blocks is still, I wouldn't say night and day, but you, you feel the difference. I was definitely, if I had to choose, what am I a little bit more uncomfortable walking through? The North Parks or the South Blocks? i say the North Blocks. Even for this film, I only got some like walkthrough shots of the North Blocks, whereas I took a little more time in the South Blocks because too many people looking at me. I got this camera on this selfie stick. Everybody knows what I'm doing. And I definitely felt like I was being, oh, here comes the sun, uh, monitored a little more closely than I would say I was in the South Blocks. Nobody was really looking at me in the South Blocks, even though I filmed more there. While these blocks between Salmon and Stark were continuously fought over, even by the dawn of the 1890s, little had actually been built there. But with the construction of the local Arlington Club's clubhouse in 1909 on Salmon Street, directly across from the northernmost point of the South Blocks, it established a large blockade to the park's ability to advance further north. But this was only one of the many buildings constructed along this six-block stretch, primarily between 1905 and 1922. 
These are mostly old hotels and commercial buildings, many of which still stand today. The oldest of these include the 1905 Eaton Hotel, the 1908 Gordon and Cornelius Hotels, and the previously mentioned 1909 Arlington Club. It's also worth noting that several of these buildings were constructed in the aftermath of the introduction of Edward Bennett's plan. At least five still standing buildings in this area were built between 1912 and 1913. These are mostly tall and domineering structures, difficult and expensive to ever take down in an effort to replace them with park space. But despite constant failures by the city and numerous old and historic buildings standing in the way of full expansion, the effort to recover these blocks has not been totally unsuccessful. On the northernmost point of these six blocks running from Salmon to Stark, bordered by Stark and Washington Streets and then 9th and Park Avenue, was once the location of another towering structure, known as the Columbia Building. In 1972, this land was sold and the Columbia was demolished, to make way for a new park to be called O'Brien Square, named after Portland's first mayor, Hugh O'Brien. When the park opened in 1973, it technically represented a gained park block. While the park was closed down in 2018 due to stability issues, as of now, the block is being redone to be named after the late Walter Cole, better known as Darcel. O'Brien Square would not be the only block regained, however. In 2009, the block surrounded by 9th and Park and Yamhill and Taylor would open up as Director Park. This park stands only one block south of the northern edge of the South Park blocks. In previous years, it was one of many blocks in downtown used for surface parking, and even in the 90s, there was an effort to build another parking garage on that block. Tom Moyer, a local businessman and real estate developer, helped revive the hopeful push to someday connect the North and South Park blocks, and was instrumental in pushing for this particular block to become a park. While Director Park became a reality, there was tragically a great deal of resistance against plans to complete these park blocks. Based on what I have read, I get the feeling that this resistance was mostly out of concern for losing a couple blocks that could be developed into something else further on down the road. If that is the case, it's really not all that surprising, as Portland has been whoring itself out to developers for quite some time now, adding to the loss of historic architecture and adding to the cost of housing and living that is continuously on the rise leaving many citizens in this city in danger of losing their homes or having to relocate somewhere else more affordable. Despite the many, many years that have passed with no success in connecting these park blocks, it still seems like, even now, there's still some lingering hope out there that this project will someday happen even though I doubt it greatly. But even with recent workings to convert O'Brien Square to a plaza named after Darcel, I see the periodic whisperings that this project will somehow be just the next in what will lead to the park blocks finally being completed. So much would need to happen, and the drama to make it happen would probably require a lot of pressure and support from locals. Right off, it would cost an absurd amount of money to purchase these blocks. And that's before we consider the costs of demolition and reconstruction on these blocks. To complete these blocks in today's dollars would be very expensive, which alone would probably draw resistance from many locals who would want the money spent on other things, understandably. Most of the buildings that would have to be demolished are about 100 years old or even older, which would bring up issues in terms of demolishing numerous historical buildings. 
this too, no doubt, would receive blowback. Blowback that I personally would most likely be in support of. And that's just the beginning of the potential problems such a project would face today. To me, perhaps the most practical resolution to this issue, which is maybe not all that practical, but just let me go with this, would be to convert the five-block stretch of Park Avenue between Salmon and Washington Streets to a thin park space. There's already a stairwell literally leading down to Park and Salmon to cross and go down Park Avenue. One block down is Director Park, which could possibly then be slightly expanded and make for a better gathering space for people who want to eat outside or go to the nearby Fox Tower, among many other things. From there, it's three more blocks down to the new Darcel Plaza site. Every time I've passed through here, there is minimal traffic. Yes, it will throw off downtown's alternating one-way system of streets as Park Avenue is a one-way going north through here, and that's an issue. There are admittedly two parking garages on this stretch, and that is also an issue that would have to be dealt with and probably require renovation to those buildings, moving these entrances to a side street and not directly onto park. Because we all know Portland can't deal without those overpriced parking garages. So yes, there would absolutely be issues with this plan, including the costs to convert roadway to park space. But is it a worse idea than buying up and demolishing all of these mostly historic buildings? No. Will this idea ever happen? I certainly wouldn't bet any money on it, especially in the immediate future, as there's lots of other issues in this city that require money and need to be taken care of desperately. Locals know what I'm talking about. This is simply the best idea I can think of, that will probably cost less than the alternatives and piss the fewest number of people off.